Well, let me uh, uh, come back now to the, of course, the more recent crisis and talk about it in the context of these general principles. Um, I think, you know, now looking back and even in, in, in the middle of the crisis, I think we, we recognize that the 2007-2009 crisis met essentially the five criteria, the five stages of the classic financial panic. Um, losses, macroeconomic stresses, subprime lending, mortgage losses, other types of real estate losses, all those things were happening, of course, and were generating losses of unknown magnitude at a wide range of financial institutions. Runs, uh, not depositors, of course, but in this case, wholesale funding, whether it was repos, a commercial paper, um, funding that was uninsured and was pulling back from companies uh, in the crisis. Third, fire sales. There was a lot of uh, pressure on downward on asset prices, stock prices, as companies dumped assets um, that they couldn't finance, and that created a additional pressure on other com companies, leading to the fourth stage, which was contagion, as uh, the combination of the depressed asset prices, the interconnections, and the opacity of the relationships between the troubled firms and other firms meant that uh, confidence fell very severely, even on firms that there was no demonstrable uh, f fear of, of insolvency at the, at the moment. Uh, and then finally, of course, the broad economic effects, which uh, we, all, we all know about and are still trying to address. Now, I think a, a fair question would be, well, if this was such a standard thing, why, why didn't we recognize it sooner? And there are a couple of answers to that. One, uh, not, not excuses necessarily, but explanations, if you will. Uh, one is that it has to do with the first principle, which is that the, uh, a panic is set off when people believe that there are significant losses to financial institutions, not just losses, but losses to critical financial institutions. And early in the crisis, um, the general view was that even though house prices might be coming down quite a bit, that this was not in kind all that different from the tech bubble bursting. The loss of paper wealth, that would affect consumer spending, it would slow the economy, but neither we, the regulators, nor the banks themselves appreciated their exposure to mortgage losses. And indeed, uh, in the 2008 transcripts which just came out, uh, I think Eric Rosengren is quoted as saying that we talked to all these big banks and we asked them, what would happen if house prices dropped 30 percent? And they all said, ah, nothing, nothing much. So it took a while to figure out that the banks were as exposed as they turned out to be to these losses. So that was one thing that we were slow to see. The other thing we were slow to see was to recognize the um, the fact that uh, runs were a different animal now. They weren't uh, depositor runs like in uh, Wonderful Life or Mary Poppins or one of those other classic films. Uh, instead, it was a, a, an invisible run of repos and commercial paper and so on, shortening their maturity, raising their rates, and ultimately even pulling back from firms. So it took time to see the, um, the basic principles of a financial panic taking place in a, in a different institutional context, and I think that was one of the issues. Now, the other challenge that the Fed and other central banks faced was that even though we sort of know what to do in a financial panic, and the first thing you do is act as a lender of last resort, and that's the first thing we did on August, of, August 2007, both the, the Fed and the ECB were aggressive in putting out cash, but there were some uh, important uh, concerns. Uh, the first was that um, the changes in the financial system had left our legal authorities behind. The, uh, what the Fed was created to do was lend to banks through the discount window. Um, but of course, the maturity transformation process was now taking place through all different kinds of, of, um, of financial institutions. And as a result, uh, the Fed had to use its 13-3 authority to lend to money market funds, to asset-backed securities, to commercial paper, um, to uh, primary dealers, et cetera. Uh, in other words, expanding the basic principle of, of lender of last resort to a much broader set of, uh, of, um, um, of firms and, and markets. The other problem, one I think that... Um, I don't think Badgett talks about it enough, I'm not sure maybe an expert here can tell me, is the problem of stigma, which is a very significant problem and was a problem early on in trying to get banks to take money from the discount window, uh, particularly if you set the, the discount rate too high above market rates, and that's the reason I think you can't do that, is that firms are very reluctant to take cash because they're afraid of being identified as weak, 
and, uh, and that would, of course, be counterproductive from their point of view. Now, we actually did a number of things um, to try to address stigma, and I think some of them, there there's some pretty clever uh, solutions there. For example, uh, the term auction facility, the TAF, auctioned discount window money to banks, but it was through an auction process. And because it was an auction process, banks could say, well, we're just taking, you know, it was a fixed amount that's being auctioned, and the price would be whatever was necessary to get people to take it. And if nobody was willing to take it, then the price would be low, and people would say, well, it's just a good economic decision to take this money. Moreover, the TAF uh, didn't put out the money immediately. It, it was a delay between the winning the bid, winning the auction, and when the money was put out. And so that reduced the sense that the bank was desperately reaching for cash. It, it was just an economic transaction. So there were various things that we did to try and address the, uh, uh, the stigma. Um, and broadly, uh, I would say that uh, ultimately the, the response uh, fit very well in the pattern of J.P. Morgan. There was lender of last resort activity. It was followed, though, by guarantees, by recapitalization, by disclosures, all the same steps that worked in 19th century uh, financial panics. Um, there were a couple of other issues I guess I would just uh, mention briefly. One has to do with um, the rescues of AIG, Bear Stearns, et cetera. I think those are very different. Th those, those were not, in our minds, were not uh, standard badger type activities. Those were ad hoc responses to a particular problem, which was that the United States does not have, or did not have, and is moving in the direction of having, but did not have at the time, a mechanism for unwinding a large financial firm in a way that was safe for the broader financial system. And as a result, the Fed used various lending authorities to try to prevent uh, the failure of, of uh, firms, addressing moral hazard as best we could by, by for example, uh, trying to arrange it so the, so the equity holders lost most of their, their value. But that was not, I wouldn't call that a badgered activity. I think that was uh, really a, um, um, a, uh, a different thing. It was an ad hoc response to a lack of a, a necessary authority when it's being addressed. The other thing I would comment on just about, the, uh, about this whole period is that uh, frequently in discussing lender of last resort activity, people talk about the distinction between illiquid and insolvent firms. And I think while there are clearly illiquid firms that you can identify as being illiquid, and there are clearly insolvent firms that you can identify as being insolvent, I think in a crisis there's a lot of gray area in the middle. And the problem is that you know, a firm that's insolvent at current market prices, if those are fire sale prices, there's a little bit of a question about whether it's an illiquidity issue in the general market or whether it um, uh, really is a genuine case of insolvency. Well, let me talk just for a minute. Uh, I want to leave a few minutes for questions, so let me talk just a minute about the regulatory response. Of course, uh, you know, a very extensive regulatory response to the crisis. Let me just talk about two things that are relevant to our discussion today. One is the changes in the lender of last resort authorities, and the other is uh, liquidity regulation. On lender of last resort authorities, um, the discount window remains in place. The Fed's discount window was not changed fundamentally by Dodd-Frank, but there were new disclosure requirements, and I'll come back to that. On 13.3, the Emergency Lending Authority, there were some changes made. First, and very importantly, 13.3 uh, can only be invoked for a broad-based program lending to a class of firms or a class of market participants. It cannot be used anymore to address a single firm. Uh, that was a very important change. Secondly, uh, use of 13.3 requires approval of the Treasury Secretary. Third, uh, there are tougher credit uh, restrictions now in terms of the, in, in the crisis, the, the criterion was secured to the satisfaction of the Reserve Bank, and now there's a tougher criterion for um, whether or not the, the loan is uh, credit worthy. And finally, tougher disclosure and reporting rules have been added. Now, what does this all do? I think that, um, uh, some of it, uh, some of these changes are 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 positive. Um, for example, the restriction to broad-based uh, lending programs. I think as long as that comes with a way to deal with failing uh, financially critical firms, uh, that's fine and that's good. It takes the Fed out of the business of, of weekend uh, emergencies. Um, and of course, Dodd Frank includes the Order Liquidation Authority, which is a way to uh, wind down a. Uh, uh, financial firm uh, in a safer way. And I think a lot of progress has been made on 
putting that uh, OLA authority into, into practice, and we can certainly talk about that. But I think, th th as I mentioned before, the, the use of the lending authority to try to prevent uh, disorderly collapses of firms was not genuine LOLR, in my opinion, lender of last resort, and I'm glad to see that those two authorities are, are broken apart. The approval of the Treasury Secretary, I think, is basically okay for democratic reasons, and because, generally speaking, the Treasury Secretary and the Fed Chairman see pretty much eye to eye and trying to prevent the financial system from collapsing. And I found that out in a number of contexts. Uh, now, there, there are a couple of other things. The other rules, though, I think are kind of two-sided. So there's the tougher repayment standard, and there's a tougher disclosure. Both of these things are very understandable from the point of view of taxpayer responsibility, accountability, d democracy, governance, et cetera. But they do potentially raise some concerns about the use of these authorities in the next crisis. On, in, in the case of the um, tougher repayment standard, um, as I mentioned, and the reason I mentioned it was that uh, the distinction between insolvency and illiquidity in a crisis is not always so clear. And sometimes judgments have to be made. And if the, if the standard of repayment is so tough that, you know, people, that the central bank is afraid to make loans in a, in a panic, that, that would be, of course, uh, unfortunate. Uh, likewise, on the disclosure requirements, again, totally understandable from the perspective of governance and accountability, but we already have pretty significant uh, stigma problems, and of course, the more quickly and more actively these uh, loans are disclosed, the worse those problems are going to be. So again, I'm not, let me be clear, I'm not saying these were mistakes or, or they're problems. Uh, they have obviously good reasons for these uh, changes, um, but uh, there are some potential downsides to the disclosure and uh, credit restrictions. The other area, and it's the last thing I'll just talk about very briefly, the other area, of course, is the imposition of liquidity reg regulations on a number of different firms. The, the fact is now that what we saw in the crisis was that um, the lender of last resort uh, privilege has been extended very broadly in the economy, wherever there's maturity transformation. And in order for that to be consistent with uh, not creating too much moral hazard, there's got to be, of course, uh, prudential requirements for, for liquidity. And so we're seeing, as you discussed already in this meeting, and I won't go into it, but the, the, the Basel III, I think one of the most important innovations in Basel III besides strengthening the capital requirements is, is the addition of uh, various liquidity requirements. I guess what I would, uh, I would just uh, point out is that the Basel uh, liquidity rules uh, are only part of what's happening in terms of liquidity regulation. There are a number of other ways in which liquidity is going to be uh, part of the oversight. For example, the bank stress tests that the Fed conducts are going to have a liquidity component as well as a capital component. Um, the Fed is discussing uh, surcharge, capital surcharges for firms that rely too much on short-term uh, unsecured funding. Uh, margin and collateral requirements are being increased quite considerably, so that, of course, is a, is a liquidity requirement. Uh, reg, uh, and on, this, on the supply side, on the, on the sources of liquidity, of course, regulation of money market funds and repo is a very hot topic, and uh, trying to, again, from the supply side, reduce the risk of a run uh, or a panic is, is a very important set of rules uh, happening. And finally, liquidity regulation of financial market utilities like exchanges and central counterparties is also uh, very extensive. So uh, one of the really major changes in financial regulation coming out of the crisis is recognition that um, the lender of last resort uh, power or uh, privilege has been extended very broadly, and that requires a lot of um, actions to make sure that um, uh, that that privilege is not uh, doesn't result in excessive uh, doesn't result in inadequate liquidity in the point of view of of, of, of firms. Many tough questions there. Um, for example, uh, how do you treat uh, your collateral you hold at the central bank? Does that count as liquidity? That's been a big source of contention in the debate. Uh, another question is. Do firms always have to hold the liquidity, or are they allowed to draw it down? If they're not allowed to draw it down, you have what's called the last taxi at the railroad station problem. The rule that says there always has to be one taxi at the railroad station means that, of course, the second one is really the last one, and et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and by the same token, the requirement that liquidity always has to be above a certain level basically means that you don't have any liquidity at all because you can't use the liquidity that you have. So there are a lot of issues there to be resolved, but 
I think that uh, this is to end, uh, the, the crisis has brought back uh, liquidity and lender of last resort activity in a very big way, and it's gonna affect both the activities of central banks and uh, a wide range of financial regulations.